Okay, hopefully everyone can see. So it's just a fabulous opportunity and I'm so grateful that Aphasia Access has asked the Centre of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehab, or as we call it, the Aphasia CRE, to uh, curate a two hour block this morning here in Australia. I understand it's uh, getting towards the post dinner activities in, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so yeah, we're just very grateful for this opportunity and uh, look forward to uh, comments and questions as we go through the next two hours as well. So as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're beaming to you here, some of us in Melbourne, uh, some of us in other parts of Australia today. And uh, in the context of COVID, unfortunately, I can't encourage you to come visit us down under, but uh, those of you that haven't been to Australia before, Melbourne's um, a particularly lovely city. Many of the people online, I just had a look who's uh, online, have been and have visited uh, us at the university and our centre but we're always interested in uh, international collaboration and visits. So please, please be in, in touch. So today I'm going to outline uh, the background for the Aphasia CRE and highlight um, the projects and capacity building work that we have planned over the next five years. And then I'm gonna give a very brief update on some progress and then hand over to five of our staff, our investigators and postdocs and students who will give a more detailed um, update on topics that they've been focusing on most recently. So to introduce the centre, it's a nationally, National Health Medical Research Council funded research centre based at La Trobe University in Melbourne but involving uh, seven universities and, and research centres, and also collaborating with a couple of international centres of excellence. So Julius Fridrikson, who was just on, on uh, aphasia access just prior to the previous speaker, is one of our associate investigators, and Cathy Price uh, in, in England, who leads the Plorus Research Group, is one of our associate investigators. So we very much based in Australia, but um, very keen for international collaboration and working towards achieving that. This is um, some, only some of our 20 investigators, eight postdoctoral fellows, 16 research affiliates and 20 higher degree students that currently form the centre. And uh, we did get to get together um, back in March last year. It seems a while since we've all been able to gather, but we do love doing that when we can. But because we operate across um, Australia, we, we have a lot of virtual contact uh, anyway, pre-COVID pre days. We have a website and I do encourage you to go visit it. Uh, today can only be a very brief taster of what we're trying to achieve in the centre. There's a lot more information on our website. And I would particularly draw your attention to our community of practice. Uh, it now numbers about 650 people across the globe. Uh, this is a really great way for us to be able to hear what are important research priorities in the world and also um, for us to be able to uh, transmit some of the information that we've been developing through our research programs and get that interaction happening. So please do go online and, and uh, sign up for free and you'll get our newsletters and um, information as it comes, comes on board. So this audience that we're talking to today knows so much about aphasia, and I certainly do not want to be seen to be teaching people to suck eggs. Um, I saw Audrey Holland's name was on the list before, and I think she taught me that, that phrase. Um, but I do want to just um, highlight what we argued to our federal government here in Australia, which enabled us to be successful in, in um, obtaining this large research grant of two and a half million Australian dollars over five years. And it's not an easy thing to do in Australia. This is a highly competitive market. Um, so we wanted to share our um, rationale with you, but also we are aware that there are some people that perhaps are on this talk today um, that are new to aphasia. So we argued that aphasia um, is a chronic communication disability. It's not just something that happens straight after a brain injury and goes away. 
for the vast majority of people, it's chronic. And of course, it's caused by damage to language processing networks in the brain. And because the language processing networks are uh, interrupted, it impacts all communicative functions that depend on language, such as turn, turning our thoughts into language and speech, understanding the speech of others, turning our thoughts into writing and decoding the written form so we can read and understand what's on the page. We know that it's very common that at least only in the population of people with stroke, there's about a third of people who experience aphasia. And importantly, that 50% of those people will still have a significant communication problem one year after their brain injury. It's very common, as we've just heard from Carol and Julius and others. Um, in Australia, we estimate there's about 120,000 people with aphasia. And interestingly, that's about the same number of the combined numbers of people with Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis in Australia. Two conditions that people know a lot about in the community, as opposed to how much they know about aphasia. So we know aphasia has significant personal impacts compromising most aspects of everyday life. And as Carol and, and her team just so clearly um, articulated, has huge effects on relationships. And we know that people with aphasia lose contact with friends over time. And this is a very, in, a very significant um, impact that needs addressing. We also know that people with aphasia have extremely low rates of return to work and this, this causes financial hardship and significant issues with identity. And when we um, tally up health related quality of life across a range of common conditions, we see that aphasia uh, unfortunately has um, very low ratings of health related quality of life. It's a significant issue. So what about some research, uh, what about some health? We know that uh, the impaired ability to communicate means a constant struggle to engage with healthcare systems and just at the time when you really need that healthcare. We also know that compared to uh, people with stroke without aphasia, that there are higher costs per stay when you have aphasia, longer hospital admissions, uh, three times the risk of adverse events while you're in hospital care, and very frequently inadequate rehabilitation that is um, adapted to the needs of people with communication disability. It's not surprising then that we know that mental health is significantly impacted by aphasia. And so we see um, people having very high rates of uh, depression, four times that of the general population and twice that of people with stroke without aphasia. One of the things that's really been challenging to deal with, and Julius highlighted this in the talk before the previous talk, there's been great difficulty in getting accurate prediction of recovery and response to treatment. This is something that um, clinicians find very difficult uh, and, and is a focus of many research groups around the world at the moment. We do have some high quality evidence in our field uh, in how to manage aphasia well, but this has not been translated into accessible and sustainable models of care. So that evidence practice gap that we hear about in the world is very strong in the field of aphasia. And technology offers so much opportunity in this field. We just saw uh, with this uh, aphasia uh, recovery connection talk, um, how important technology is to enable uh, those social connections to happen. <clears throat> but, but these have not been adequately harnessed uh, to meet the needs, fully meet the needs of people with aphasia. So we do know that aphasia treatments can be effective but we don't know which therapies and schedules are the best or uh, who gets the best response and when. There's a lot of work to do to personalise uh, the evidence that we have so that it works best 
to maximise recovery for individuals with aphasia. And we have a curious phenomenon operating at the moment where people with aphasia are systematically excluded from general stroke research, even though they represent a third of that stroke population. And this is usually because they require additional supports to participate. And that can happen, but it ha isn't happening very well at the moment. And you'll hear from one of our staff members soon about this topic. So in summary, the most pressing barriers that we saw and we argued to our national funding body was that there is inaccurate and unreliable prediction of aphasia recovery and treatment response, that there's this high rate of mental health challenge after aphasia, and that many of the psychological services that are available are talking based, that there is poor adherence to evidence-based recommendations across the continuum of care, that people with aphasia are systematically excluded from general stroke research, and that many of our methods are unsuitable or unsustainable because they focus on individual and face-to-face -face models of care. So it was a pretty grim picture, we, we argued to the National Health Medical Research Council, and they listened and they saw that this was something that requires change. And they uh, trusted us to go and start doing something about this in, in uh, collaboration with all the excellent work that's going on around the world. So we formed the Aphasia CRE and we have a lofty goal. We said we would transform the health and well-being of people with aphasia and their families through enhanced cost-effective and sustainable interdisciplinary aphasia rehab and community services that are equipped to meet the need. And in order to do that, we have to have multidisciplinary um, disciplinary teams. It's not the domain of speech pathology in people with aphasia only. Clearly, we need everybody in the healthcare system to be aligned to what we're trying to do to improve the lives of people with aphasia. And in order for us to do the research that would underpin some of that practice change, we need high levels of support, such as uh, data analytics and health economics. And this is what's in our centre. We have four main innovative programs of research. One concerns the neurobiological and psychosocial predictors of recovery so that we can move closer towards personalising aphasia right. interventions. One informs, uh, it, uh, involves trying to find more effective treatments for um, aphasia and management programs across the continuum of care. So not just while people are in hospital, but for the lifespan. One involves using technology to improve healthcare communication and rehabilitation. And the fourth involves optimising mental health and wellbeing in aphasia. We have four fabulous chief investigators that run those programs. I won't go through all the detail of that today for time, but please do look at our website and, and learn about their um, amazing work. Inside each of those four programs, we have what we call our beacon projects. So we promised the NHMRC that we would run a number of projects um, over the next five years within those four programs. And um, of the 12 that we've listed there, we are uh, well on track for moving those forward. In fact, in the capacity building work that we're doing, our number of projects now within the centre numbers 35. So we are definitely doing the capacity building work that we've been funded to do. I don't have time to go into each of those today. There is information about them on the website. And certainly you could um, email the uh, leads of each of those programs if you had specific information, uh, uh, questions about them. One thing I wanted to point out was that um, inside our centre, we have um, a kind of uh, research hub that is underpinning a lot of the work. Um, and you'll hear some of the work from Kira Shigan soon about the research hub. But we also are moving towards high level knowledge translation resources. So these might be um, tech based, web based uh, implementation resources. And one of those is the Australian Aphasia Rehab Pathway, which was 
The main product of a previous centre of research excellence here in Australia led by Linda Worrell. Many of you might have seen the Australian Aphasia Rehab Pathway previously um, and it's an evidence-based portal where evidence um, concerning aphasia care is listed uh, under each of um, eight different portals, for example, in assessing intervention, uh, addressing personal factors and so on. <clears throat> right now that, that uh, resource is under renovation and it's part of the work of the aphasia CRE. So um, we hope to have the evidence updates into that um, portal by the end of next year, but importantly, loading clinic ready resources uh, to, to that so that when people are looking at the latest evidence, they can also see how best to implement it, um, find the tools and resources they need to, to um, get that practice change to happen. So look out for that uh, towards the end of next year. So I talked about progress. I said that I'd mentioned progress. So we are only uh, 12, uh, 15 months into our funding and I'm happy to say we're fully staffed and all our projects are operational. And some of the, that big capacity building work that we've been funded to do is well on the way. And I feel like at the moment where um, the image I have is a, a fruit tree that has um, begun to bud. Uh, and if you come back and visit us in, in uh, perhaps 12 months time, you'll see fruit forming. And uh, certainly by the end of the five years, I imagine we're going to have a pretty significant harvest um, activity to do from uh, the research that we're undertaking. So we're well on the way um, and very excited. So to finish my part of the talk today, and before I hand over to five of our staff for the next um, period of time, I wanted to focus on one particular study that forms, um, uh, that aligns to program two, the treatment effectiveness program, um, and just give you an update about that work. <clears throat> So one of the projects we're running in that program is called COMPARE. COMPARE um, is uh, an acronym that stands for Constraint Induced or Multimodal Personalised Aphasia Rehabilitation. Neatly fitted into the word COMPARE, which was great because we were comparing treatments. And it's a randomised control trial for stroke-related chronic aphasia <clears throat> and a fabulous team of people um, uh, involved in that trial here in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the paper that you can see on the screen at the moment is the published protocol for the trial. So the trial compares two um, treatments that are uh, being used in the world at the moment. One is constraint-induced aphasia therapy. Uh, and most people who've um, studied aphasia and worked in aphasia rehab would know a lot about constraint-induced aphasia therapy or SIAT as its um, acronym is, is called. So SIAT focuses on speech production as its major output. It involves socially mediated speech practice, uh, usually given in an, in, in an intensive and high dose, typically around 30 hours over about two weeks. And it's um, focused very heavily on trying to minimise any learned non-use that a person with aphasia might have developed, um, given that their speech production and language and speech production is difficult. One of the things that happens in that treatment um, usually is that barriers are put up between the three people that might be working together in the therapy to stop them using multimodal communication as the primary method of communication, such as gesture and drawing and writing. <clears throat> and um, the uh, social interaction is a, a very big part of this intervention. And it has high levels of evidence um, suggesting its efficacy. Um, the particular version, SIAT Plus, has the addition of orthographic cueing, so people get to see the written word, and there's home practice tasks assigned for to, to uh, maximise carryover of any gains that might be achieved in the therapy. Multimodality aphasia therapy is another therapy that's being used at the moment, and this is one that focuses also on speech production as its main output. But how it gets there is through the use of multimodal cues and practice. And these support the, the um, 
uh, reaccess and, rep and reproduction of speech. So people are asked to draw and write and gesture and read as they're um, carrying out these socially mediated tasks and similarly given in the high intensity dose. So these two treatments differ in the way in which they consider the neuroplastic response of the brain uh, during therapy. One saying that communication is a multimodal function and so the best way to get res restoration in language and speech is to, is to involve that multimodal functionality. And the other, science saying that would actually make uh, the response worse, that it's better to focus more on speech only. So these two treatments are oppositional. And we've compared them in a trial of 216 participants with chronic post-stroke aphasia. And they've had 30 hours of therapy over two weeks, and they've worked in groups of three participants, and we've tracked their daily home practice. And they carry out um, tasks involving words, phrases, and sentence production in socially rich communication games. The third arm of this study is a usual care arm for comparison. So the 216 participants are spread across those three arms. And here's some example of some of the stimuli that we use. So pictured um, objects and actions uh, that form the basis of word, word, phrase, and sentence production. We uh, measure the response to this immediately post-intervention and 12 weeks follow-up with a range of outcome measures. And I won't go through all those now. But I am really happy to tell you that we finished the randomization for this trial in March of this year. And our final data points uh, for the follow-up will be gathered um, in July. And our results are expected in late 2020. And I just can't wait to bring you the results of that trial. I don't know them because I'm blinded to it, but I'm hoping that there's some good signal and some good power given the 216 individuals that we've randomized. Okay, so I'm now at 19 and a half minutes, Todd, so might be too late for questions. Um, and then I'll just introduce the next uh, speakers. And some of those speakers' talks don't go for the whole 20 minutes, so we'll be able to make up some time there as well. As much as I would like to hear every second taken up, that's music to my ears, Miranda, I'm not gonna lie. Um, why don't we, I think we do need to go to the next speaker. If you have questions, throw them in the chat and Miranda and I can connect and we will make sure that we get some feedback to everybody uh, just a little bit down the road. Yeah, great. So we're, the five talks that are coming up now are from postdocs and investigators in the CRE. And they're going to uh, take you around the wheel here, except for program one, I think. Uh, and so here they are. And the first one of cap off the rank is uh, Dr. Kira Shiggins, and she's going to talk about inclusion of people with aphasia in stroke research across disciplines. So I'll stop share a screen now.